after you brought malaria to Seattle yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and had that distinction, um, t tell me so about the direction of your research So fortunately at that time, then. the Gates Foundation was founded and they uh, expressed an interest in uh, global infectious diseases. So uh, I put, put in an application requesting support for our uh, malaria vaccine program, which was funded and uh, initially uh, allowed us to recruit three investigators in for malaria vaccine development, two of whom are still here now, working mm -hmm. diligently and successfully on malaria vaccine development. Mm -hmm. The third has left and has now taken over the position of Lou Miller mm -hmm. at NIH. So that was oh, wow. a very welcome uh, opportunity uh, for the center and uh, led to a very successful and still expanding malaria research program. Shortly thereafter, uh, for similar reasons, we were able to recruit researchers into the area of HIV research, more focused on vaccine, and then also in the area of TB research, mm -hmm. uh, initially for the development of diagnostics and then later on drug development. And we were fortunate that we were able to get some uh, support from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation to recruit uh, researchers uh, into that program. So that focused us on what we call the big three. And then more recently, uh, we've added other areas, uh, the, which we collectively call uh, systems biology of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. So in this way, what we're doing is we're now focusing not on single diseases and just trying to solve single diseases, but we're developing fundamental biological understanding across multiple diseases for the purpose of understanding human immune responses mm -hmm. to individual infectious diseases, but across infectious diseases to understand how to develop uh, vaccines for more than one disease, but also to understand how the immune system is actually involved in the disease process, which it is in some cases. So the immune system mm -hmm. is functioning to not only prevent disease, but sometimes it's actually part of the pathogenesis mm. uh, of disease. Part of the dysfunction. Exactly. So then the systems approach to biology would be, um, I guess, a more holistic approach than a single, uh, I guess, chemistry or biology or a single very focused, narrow approach. Would that be accurate or? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, there have been, I would say, three revolutions in, uh, in biology. Mm -hmm. So the, the first revolution was starting to actually make measurements rather than be philosophical or just try to reason what are the causes of disease. Mm -hmm. So that's empiricism. The second revolution was then to do, look at things individually, look at the component parts. What does a gene do? What does a protein do? However, what's happened is there's been massive uh, improvements in technology. Mm -hmm. the ability to collect information, make measurements, hundred, mm -hmm. at literally millions of measurements uh, a day mm -hmm. on what genes are doing and, and so on, but also uh, parallel developments in computation, which is able to store, manipulate, and analyze millions and millions of units of, uh, of data. Mm -hmm. And so this in, has now enabled the, what I'll call the third revolution, which is the systems biology revolution, which is the ability to look at multiple different types of measurements, asking the same type of question, such as why does a vaccine work or doesn't work, or why does a drug work or not work, mm -hmm. because now we're able to make literally millions and millions of measurements, but also analyze those measurements. Mm -hmm. So what this means is we can now look at these complex biological problems uh, in a way that's actually approaching the complexity of what the problem actually is. Mm -hmm. Not just looking at one component part of the problem because these biological problems are not due to just one thing. Mm -hmm. So with these new big data analysis techniques and the fact that you do have these millions of measurements together, you can do much, have much more refined models, do much better research. Right, we can start to uh, understand things at a level of complexity that we can start to predict mm -hmm. what's going to happen because we have a greater understanding of how these biological systems actually work. And so the consequence of changing one thing 
we are starting, we're still at the very early mm -hmm. stages of understanding how the consequence of one thing happening ripples through this very complex network mm -hmm. of interacting uh, components of a biological system and then to be able to predict what's the consequence uh, of uh, that mm -hmm. change. So I guess um, one of the outgrowths of this increased research these days when I go to the news, um, one of the things I'm reading about is people talking about a time when malaria will be cured, similar to smallpox. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that and how soon the time frame is, what sort of progress. Um. You sound like one of our board members who's always, <laughs> <laughs> who's always asking, so okay. So when are you going to be done with malaria? <laughs> when are you going to be done? On, dude. Like. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, this is a very difficult and challenging question to answer and give give real true perspective of that what's really going to lead to the eradication of malaria, for example, mm -hmm. which is conceivable, but it'll probably not happen in my lifetime and hopefully could happen in my children's lifetime, mm -hmm. but even that's not guaranteed. And that's because it's a very complex problem. These organisms have been uh, in people and adapting to people since people have existed, essentially. So they have become very integrated and adapted. And so they've learned how to contend with the really complicated system, which is people. Mm -hmm. uh, so malaria is a, is a complex problem. The malaria parasite reproduces much more rapidly than humans. So it can continually adjust to the defenses that the human can keep changing. So it's a, it's a, constant, it's a, a constant battle. And then malaria is not a single disease-causing organism. There's probably five or six different types of malaria, and they've all developed different strategies to be able to survive and get transmitted uh, by a mosquito. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, since there are literally uh, hundreds of millions of cases of malaria a year, mm -hmm. not many people realize that, hundreds of millions of cases, mm -hmm. that tells you how many malaria-infected mosquitoes and how many malaria organisms must be out in the environment. Mm -hmm. So contending with them and the human behavior <laughs> that's needed to be able to do the right things to avoid getting an infection or get treated, et cetera, mm -hmm. is a very complex uh, problem. So uh, there's probably not going to be a silver bullet solution mm -hmm. to the malaria problem. It will probably involve how do you avoid mosquitoes? How do you detect a malaria infection as soon as possible? How do you treat it? How do you develop a vaccine that's going to work against most types of malaria? Mm -hmm. Since the malaria parasite- It's continually evolving. It's evolving, so very few vaccines are 100% effective, and so the vaccine will drive some, some changes in the malaria parasite. So there will be a continual uh, mm -hmm. process. But our, our mantra is people, science, hope, okay? So we, we are people and we're doing research for people. We do science, but we have, we're providing hope that there will eventually be a solution so that there could eventually be total eradication of malaria. I guess I wanted to draw you back. Um, you talked about hope and uh, the motto written back there, mm -hmm. people, science, hope. Um, how does it feel to wake up every day and know you're pushing back one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Um, I would say that the feeling I have every morning is one of uh, excitement because uh, this is a very interesting and exciting endeavor. Uh, one that I feel very fortunate to be able to be doing the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I actually feel privileged uh, to be able to do this. I could be doing manual labor or something. I feel like I'm doing something that's very worthwhile, very exciting, very intellectually rewarding, and it's, it's a good thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, it's very daunting. I mean, these are huge, complicated problems. How to solve these complex problems in the best way possible. For some perverse reason, I like complex problems. Uh, I see beauty. I see beauty in the, biolo the com biological complexity. And uh, when I'm in the laboratory, even though, or near the laboratory and I'm being presented with the data, mostly what I see are numbers. 
mm -hmm. okay? But in my mind, I have these uh, beautiful pictures of what's going on and understanding, trying to understand and keep refining my understanding of how these uh, cells function and how this uh, impacts uh, disease. So if you were talking to a young academic or researcher who really wanted to do something with their research and uh, bring it beyond the laboratory or beyond their PhD, what would you tell them? I think I would uh, give them the same advice that I got many decades ago from a uh, person I did a postdoc with. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, decide what you think is important mm -hmm. and then act on it. Mm -hmm. So in my case, what was important to me uh, was to try to do the best research that I could do in the area that I thought was important, namely infectious diseases. I found that uh, the academic environment was not conducive to what I wanted uh, to do. Mm -hmm. I found that the for-profit environment, pharmaceutical companies, was not conducive because they were just focused on the development of single products. I was more interested in developing fundamental understanding that would not only advance my own research, but would advance the research of many others and could lead to multiple products, but also could lead to uh, solutions to the specific diseases that I was, uh, that I was working on. Mm -hmm. So I think like so many other things, it's uh, find your passion, find where your interest is, mm -hmm. and then uh, just push as hard as you can, but in the right way, uh, to be able to accomplish what you think is important. Mm -hmm. and I think this institution uh, has, uh, in a certain sense, uh, captured the best of from my perspective, of both of those worlds. So in the academic uh, area, the approach is to develop new knowledge and new understanding. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, uh, understanding that you don't necessarily know what, if any, application will come from, from that. Mm -hmm. As it turns out that most of the real advances actually come from that undirected research. Mm -hmm. In the uh, for-profit area, the ph pharmaceutical area, mm -hmm. That's an area where the applications are pretty clear now because those initial findings and their developments and how they're going to lead to a product are pretty clear. And they tend to be more or less what I would call linear. Mm -hmm. It becomes more of an engineering process now to take the knowledge that's known, the proof of principle that's been established, and develop it in a way that you can scale it up and market it, et, et cetera, and get it out there. This center is right between those two, trying to capture the best of both. How can we, in an intelligent way, not just do undirected research, but do research that's on infectious diseases that we think is heading in the right direction, but be exploratory at the same time to develop fundamental understanding that would not only advance our own research goals, but advance the goals of, uh, of others but also at the same time be very alert to the possibility that the findings, in fact some of the materials that we develop, could actually get in short term, uh, go into this development process and lead to products. So both focus on the short term and the long term. Short term and um, the long term. Both. And be and uh, what I would call circumspect, be aware of you know, the context within which we're doing the, the research. So Ken, if you could tell me a little bit about the state of infectious diseases and disease research 40 years ago when CIDR first came into existence and now. 40 years ago, I would say, compared to what we know now, we knew almost nothing. <laughs> it's actually quite astounding. Uh, what I talked about earlier in terms of this uh, process of RNA editing, what we knew was that if you stained a cell you could see a little dark dot, which turned out to be the particular set of genes which are making the energy generating system in this uh, organism. It was just a dot. Uh, over time, we were able to uh, map those pieces of DNA, literally just the pieces of DNA. We didn't know what they did. And then over time, we were able to sequence those and understand what the proteins were that they made. And then over time, we were able to identify the processes that were happening within that uh, cell 
including how all of the 10,000 genes in this particular organism are working together. We're just starting to get insight and how they're working together to make this whole organism function and, they're, and as a consequence cause disease. And, then, uh, and now we're starting to understand how that disease process is affecting the human organism and then how the human organism is responding to that. Mm -hmm. So whereas we started with a particular dot that you could see in a stain cell on a microscope, now we're able to map out uh, the activities of literally uh, between 10 and, 10 and 20 thousand human genes in response to an infection as well as the 10,000 genes of this organism and then all of the interacting molecules and all of those interactions to understand what's going on. So this is just an illustration of what the complexity of the system is, but in reality it's getting that understanding of the complexity and being able to understand the consequences of that that will allow us to develop a vaccine because we do not need to know absolutely everything, but we need to know what is relevant that's going to lead to the development of a protective immune response that will protect people from getting infected. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge difference between 40 years ago and now because we are now, because of the tools, the technical tools and the computational tools, we're able to take very uh, large amounts of complex information and be able to understand how that information relates to the development of a vaccine or a drug uh, or a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. It's daunting to think about the future <laughs> because if you were to ask me 40 years ago, what do you think the state of understanding would be of the, uh, these biological systems? I would underestimate mm -hmm. uh, the advances that we've made because these advances tend to build upon each other very fast mm -hmm. and so the computational tools keep improving, so our ability to take very large amounts of data and be able to reduce them to some visual representation of that data so we can so a human can understand it. Those tools are incredibly valuable, just as the tools are that are able to collect millions and millions of data points that now go into that visualization program. And then we will be able to have uh, the ability to predict uh, how to prevent uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. So I guess then um, what do you see as really the next thing for CIDR and yourself to tackle in the next, in 2017, 2018, immediate, the immediate future? So as I look to the future, and I'm unable to predict the future, uh, but uh, a few things come to mind. So one is uh, what is now called synthetic biology, which is the ability to, I think, further manipulate biological systems. This uh, is sometimes frightening to people, but in fact, we've been manipulating biological systems for eons. Uh, dog breeding, plant breeding. The difference here is that we're able to uh, change biological systems more quickly and probably in uh, ways that we couldn't have even conceived of before. And so uh, this means that uh, we may have the ability, for example, to develop new immunization techniques where we can use organisms uh, to deliver vaccines rather than syringes. We may be able to, and people have already talked about this, mm -hmm. using bacteria that have been uh, changed so that they can deliver uh, vaccines, but by uh, ingesting. Uh, so a pathogen of health. A in pathogen some of sense. health, right? Okay. A, a good bug rather than mm -hmm. a bad bug, right? Or the ability to, as they're now doing with uh, immune therapy, take your own cells and make some changes in your own cells and reintroduce them into you, so that they are able to eliminate uh, tumor cells or uh, cells that are behaving uh, inappropriately. A second uh, prob major advance, I guess, was is what one would uh, in the area of computation is what uh, might be called machine learning. In other words, having uh, computers uh, do make correlations and uh, do analyses of large data sets more quickly uh, than uh, the human brain can do. So uh, I think another advance will be to be able to interrogate 
these complex mixtures of cells, such as in blood, uh, at individual cell levels and try to understand how these cells not only differ from each other, but how they are somehow communicating with each other and responding, for example, to an infection or to a, uh, to a vaccine. The whole body ecosystem effect there. Exactly. Obviously, your work is incredibly consuming and you love it. That's apparent throughout this whole yep. interview. Um, but what do you do, like, at some point, you, you must go home to some place that is not the lab. Yes. Um, what do you do to relax and unwind? However, I do like to relax. Mm -hmm. I tend to uh, relax in a more active fashion. So uh, I like to sail. Uh, we have a sailboat. So uh, actually on Sunday, my son and I were out sailing in the rain. It was fantastic. Uh, I like the activity of a sailboat. I like, I like the, uh, the feeling of being out on the water uh, very much. I like the water. I like scuba diving. I like diving. I don't dive around here. I like to go to the warmer waters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I enjoy that uh, very much, or sailing in the warmer waters. And mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy skiing as well. Uh, I enjoy skiing very much. So, uh, and reading. Mm -hmm. And I do watch television. You know, I do like to get some uh, uh, freedom of the brain. And that little bit of the day that you're not doing <laughs> yes, everything right. else. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, is there one thought you could leave us with? Uh, well, there's a, that's a difficult... Uh, um, Something to mull over yeah. after we watch this. Yeah, um, yeah I, guess, I guess the thought that I would leave, leave you with is uh, there should be more organizations like this. Mm -hmm. This is a really important, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> as you can tell. So do you feel strongly totally about this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, you watch television at night and you see people suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, suffering from these diseases, okay? Mm -hmm. And here we have uh, somewhere between two and three hundred people uh, trying to deal with diseases that are affecting seven billion people. Well, not seven billion, but billions of people on, in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're struggling every day to make incremental progress on these huge, important problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a crime, in my mind, that there's not more organizations like this and more work that's being done in, the, in this area. So that's, that's what I would leave you with. Okay. Well, Ken, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thanks for giving me the chance. <laughs> hey guys, thanks so much for watching my very first Starting Ideas video. You have no idea how much planning went into this. But if you believe that ideas change the world, if you believe that one person can change the world, please click subscribe and support Starting Ideas on Patreon, because I really want to keep more great quality content coming your way with people whose thoughts and ambitions have driven them to alter the world and make it a better place. See you later.